Thanks so much for taking the time to sit down with us, Dr. Oswald. I really appreciated your lecture. Thank you, uh, and thanks, Nathan, for joining us as well. Of course. So one of the themes that you picked up on your, in your lecture was um, that you see creation ex nihilo uh, actually in Isaiah as well, and that it's derivative of uh, the creation account in Genesis. So would you be able to unpack for us a little bit how you see ex nihilo playing out in the overall message of Isaiah, of the book of Isaiah, particularly in its original context? Well, it's a large question. It's a large book. <laughs> and I've spent a long time working on it. But overall, what the book of Isaiah is saying is, God has a plan for the world. You see it immediately in chapter 2. All the nations will come. And in this sense, then, I'm convinced that the emphasis on servanthood in chapters 40 to 66 tells us how we should read 1 to 39. Who is Israel? Israel is the servant of God for the sake of the world. The first 39 chapters then are dealing with the question of, can we really trust God? If we're going to be his servants, we've got to be able to say, I can trust him implicitly, absolutely. And that's a big question. It's the question that is immediately introduced in chapter 7, after the call narrative in chapter 6. Ahaz is challenged to trust God to deliver him from the Syrians and the Israelites and not to trust Assyria. Ahaz chooses to trust Assyria. And the rest that is played out there in chapters 7 to 12 is, okay, whatever you trust in place of God is going to turn on you and destroy you, which is what Assyria does. But when that has happened, God is not going to abandon you. He's going to bring his Messiah, the true son of David, not like Ahaz, who will be your deliverer. Wow. In some senses, the rest of the book isn't playing out of those themes. 13 to 33 are don't trust the nations. Good grief. Why would you trust human beings who are already under God's judgment and some of whom are going to turn to him for salvation? No, don't trust them. Trust God. Then 36 to 39 is really a replay of chapter 7 and its immediate results. And you see that especially the very place that Isaiah met Ahaz and challenged him to trust God, that's where the Assyrian officer stands 30 years later and says, don't believe Hezekiah. You can't trust God. Hezekiah does trust God. And so it's a sense in a case study, can God be trusted? Yes. Trust him to deliver you now, not from Syria and Ephraim, but from Assyria. And he'll do it. Okay, now we know God can be trusted, but will we trust him? And I think, and, and uh, I've had some interesting discussions on this with other students of Isaiah, I think that the reason Hezekiah is depicted in a rather negative way in chapter 39 and uh, 38 and 39 is precisely on this point. One-time trust doesn't do it. It's got to be a life of trust. So what will motivate us to do that? Then you switch to the exilic environment. And I, <laughs> uh, Brevard Child says, Oswald believes in clairvoyance. Uh, and I guess I do, because I do believe that God empowered Isaiah to speak to those people generally, not specifically, but generally. What will motivate us to serve God? Grace. The grace that comes and, and this is where our question really comes to the fore. Can God deliver his servants? 
okay, look at geopolitical realities. Yeah, he delivered us from Assyria, but he didn't deliver us from Babylon, did he? So either he was defeated by the Babylonian gods or our sin defeated him. One way or the other, God has been defeated. We've just got to learn to settle down here in Babylon and become good Babylonians. And Isaiah says, no, no. He's not one of the gods. He's the God who brought the world into existence. He is not material. Matter. And I, 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 again, I'll get carried away here. But as he says in one place, I didn't create this world of chaos. Matter is not my enemy. Matter is my servant. I have made it and I can use it. So, therefore, I'm free to do new things. And that, that constant repetition of newness, I think, is the, is the real element that he's using bara for. Uh, the, the idea of, yes, in the beginning, it was creation out of nothing. He's not creating out of nothing now. But he is the one who can do that. He can do something that is radically new. So he can make rivers on mountaintops. And we say, what? <laughs> well, obviously, it's an illustration. But the point is, you're going to sing a new song. And I, I particularly like in chapter 43, where he says, you know, I'm the God who divided the waters. And the enemy came through, and they died, and they all drowned. Now forget that, because I'm going to do a new thing. I think this time, instead of having a uh, Hebrew baby in the river who becomes your deliverer, I think this time I'll use a pagan emperor. <laughs> Wait a minute. <laughs> How can you do that? And, and it's interesting in chapter 45 that you get that question raised. How can you do this? And his answer is, does the jug say to the potter, you made me wrong? <laughs> so it's that emphasis that I can do a new thing. I can deliver. And, and again, forgive me for going on here at such length, but you are my servants. But God, we sinned. We broke the covenant. We've lost the land. You are my servants. Grace. Grace. But how can you do that, God? How can you make sinful people your servants? Are you just going to ignore our sin? Yeah, you're going to take us home, but how can you take us back to yourself? Chapters 49 to 55 are grace, the means of servanthood. And it's the suffering servant who will be for Israel what Israel could not be for itself. Again, now, in those chapters, you don't have so many usages of bara, uh, but still, it's the idea of a new thing. And, of course, 53 is really amazing in the sense how new that is, that in weakness, God is going to deliver. Hmm, that's a new thing. And then when you come then into 56 to 66, it's the question of, okay, we're your servants. You've brought us back. We really didn't have to repent necessarily. You just, how did we become your servants? <laughs> just by election. And uh, God says, no. There's going to have to be, again, a new thing. The warrior is going to have to come now, not the baby, <laughs> not the suffering servant. The warrior is going to have to come and defeat the enemy of sin in your life. And then you come to that glorious central section, arise, shine, thy light is come. And the kings will come to your rising. So <laughs> it's a big book. <laughs> but, but particularly, he is utilizing this idea that God can do something brand new which the gods can never do. Yeah. And so that ties into uh, your earlier point about how creation ex nihilo um, weaves together both creation 
and redemption. Yes, yes, because yes. The, the only real new thing is the incarnation. Yes. When God became man. Yes. And that those two are intrinsically connected. Intrinsically connected. Yes, yes, yes. That he can break in to the cycle of sin and break it and do a new thing. And of course, in, in the context, and this is, this is interesting because it, it's a bit of an argument from silence, but so far as we know, nobody had ever gone home from exile before. When you went into exile, you disappeared. So the very idea, you're going to go home. What? It's a new thing. It's a new thing. And, well, I better stop. <laughs> I'll go on. <laughs> in, uh, in the film The Sound of Music, at one point Maria sings, uh, nothing e comes from nothing, nothing ever has, therefore I must have done something good that good things can only happen to her because she had done something good in the past. Uh, my supervisor is the one who suggests this example to me that <laughs> it's just, it's just this terrible bit of theologizing because the, what the church wants to say is, no, God can make something of yes. someone who's never done anything good, yes. that it's not that yes. we've done something good in our past yes. that exactly. allows a potential for God to do something good. So, so that, that power that we describe as creation from nothing, it, it's, it, it, it ties back into the order of redemption again, exactly. that, that God can act even in the midst of darkness, light can shine. Yes, yes, and that, you know, when you think of the uh, construction of the word transform, yes, it is to make new, to make into a new form. And uh, as I said in the lecture, it's uh, uh, paganism in all its forms, the best it can offer is self-realization. Thank God, <laughs> our God offers transformation. Well, thanks so much for taking the time to sit down with us, Dr. Oswald and Nathan.